Whew, man. Greetings, I'm Meg Only. I'm the Andrea B. Laporte Associate Curator. And I just have to say, I'm shocked to be here on time. I was dropping off my new puppy, Marcus Barkus. Um, <laughs> legit his name. And I left my cell phone in the lift. And I have to say, like Maori, I hate to say this in, amongst a group of people, I don't take public transportation anymore. <laughs> and so I was like, I do not know how I'm gonna get here. I don't have my phone. And so luckily, ICA staff got me here. Derek, thank you so much. It would be incredibly uh, poignant to be late for Color People Time, my exhibition that I've curated over the course of the year. Um, but I gotta say, this is the last uh, program Thank you all for attending. I also was nervous not people would turn out. It's turning cold and I don't know, it's getting dark. So let's get things started. Um, tonight we're presenting a screening and I just wanna give a huge shout out to Sophia who's sitting here directly in front of me. Um, it's in conjunction obviously with my exhibition Color People Time and we're presenting Sophia's, uh, Sophia Nolly Allison's A Love Song for Latasha as well as Jatavia Gary who could not join us tonight, Givernay Document. I just want to let you know we're going to do the screening first. Giverne document is about 49, 50 minutes. Um, and then we're going to move along then to a love song for Latasha, which is about 19 minutes. And then uh, Mary Carmel Holmes, who has curated this program tonight, um, will be in conversation with Sophia. And I just have to give a huge shout out to Mayori sitting in the back. Um, <laughs> Mayori was one of the first people I talked to around this exhibition and thinking through this. And as we develop this over the course of the year, she has also programmed a series that you currently are in um, of screenings that have happened over the course of time. And so I just really appreciate always being in conversation with you. You constantly inspire me. I love you a lot. And so thank you for doing this. And thank you for being kind of the penultimate program in this full series, because I know you and I are both very tired. Um, a few things to read at you for a moment. A huge thank you to the Pew Center uh, for Arts and Heritage, Arthur Cohen and Daryl Ott, Sherry, Stephen, Sherry and Stephen Friedman, Brett and Daniel uh, Sundheim, and Stephanie and David Simon, as well as Emily and Gerald Spiegel Fund, and the, legal, the Lisa Spiegel Wilkes and Jeffrey Wilkes Family Foundation, and Hillary and Mitchell Morgan. Uh, thank you to our donors. And I want to give a huge shout out to Tusef Noor in the back and Derek Rigby, who has made all of this possible tonight. Um, enjoy the program. Um, can you raise your hands if you have questions? Because we don't have a lot of time, so I don't want to go over if there are any. There's a few. OK. So thank you so much for this. Can thank we give her a round thank of applause? You. Thank you. Meg and I were so excited when Sophia said she was available because <laughs> we really wanted to show this film after seeing it at Black Star this summer. Um, so I'm always moved by it because I'm almost there. They're a little bit older. Um, Latasha's like one or two years older than me, but I remember this moment so much. Um, and it like combined with the Atlanta child murders like explains so much of my anxiety. Um, but I'm curious for you, you're like almost a decade younger. How did this impact you? Um, first of all, thank you all so much for being here and thank you for including this film. It's such a beautiful conversation with Jatavia. Um, so I'm a native of Los Angeles of South Central. I was a young girl during the LA riots, so too young to remember that much, but I still have some really visceral memories of just the images that were happening at that time. And when I was in grad school, I remember just doing a lot of research about the history of black women and black girls in South Central and any time I discovered Latasha's name online, it was always in context with her death, and I just felt it needed to exist outside of that, and there was no documentation of that evidence outside of the video of her trauma and reports of the actual murder happening. There was nothing else really building a picture of who Latasha was. And I felt really connected to it, being a South Central native, but also Latasha lost her life when she was 15, and my dad passed away when I was 15, and so there's an interesting conversation of what does it mean when childhood is disrupted at that age, um, and that's the age I actually left Los Angeles. So I always feel like I'm going back and trying to 
re-excavate these memories and build this archive for myself and for the community and for other black women and black girls. And really wanting Ty and Shanice to have that platform for their story to be heard because too often it's just the adults that are the ones voicing what happened during that time period. And the young children who did experience the trauma are not able to express what that experience was like for them. Yeah, and thank you for that. Um, so Jatavia can't be with us, um, but I think there's a interesting play between the films, both formally, um, but then also when the content, um, looking at like bodily safety, when Jatavia is asking that question, and um, violence and depictions of violence. And so you made a clear decision not to reenact Latasha's murder. Um, and there were about five films that came out um, in 2017, the 25th anniversary of the riots, and most of them show it. And so can you talk a little bit about that decision? Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of films always replay that video footage. It is easy to find on YouTube, and I just didn't feel that I needed to re-trigger the family or the friends of anyone that knew Latasha. I didn't want to trigger black women and black girls, and I didn't feel that our existence needed to be worthy because of trauma. So I wanted the audience to have to excavate who Latasha was before you're given that information, because so often it's just the headlines, even Latasha's Wikipedia page, it's the death of Latasha Harlins. And it's like, what happens if we, f we allow her to exist in that fullness and exist in that life? And you have to do the actual work to get to know her before you can even hear and know how the story ends. Um, and I just didn't feel a need to redo that, something that I really wanted to do with this documentary is challenge colonized forms of preservation and challenged um, what traditional documentary looks like, and because there's no archival footage of Latasha having to conjure up these memories and these images, and wanting her to only exist in that fullness, and just felt that the video footage did not need to be repeated. It's been seen too many times. I appreciate that. Um, the other thing that um, the film makes me think about, um, having lost someone who was really young, and I, someone recently shared with me, and I'm not crying for emotions, my mascara is running, so I just wanted to know that. Um, <laughs> but someone just shared with me, it's like uh, there's an Irish term, wraith, and then there's a Portuguese term, saudade, which is like, um, it's grief, but it's a particular grief about what could have been. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what Ty and Shanice are talking about. Um, and I'm curious for you, um, because I, when you talk about this remaking the archive, you're also recreating what we couldn't know in a way. And I'm wondering um, what Ty and Shanice feel about the film, and sort of, you know, if you you mentioned, you know, that last title card, what they're doing, but what are they up to right now? Um, they're actually really happy with it and really pleased with it, and they're just so happy to see a film that really talks in, in depth about who Latasha was. Um, and who she could have been. And so that has been one of the most healing things for me to see how appreciative and how healing this process has been for them. Uh, Cause I'm just really grateful that they trusted me with this story. And Shanice unfortunately lost her mom a year ago on, on Christmas. So that anniversary is coming up and that's been extremely hard for her. I know that she does not want to follow in the footsteps of her mom who was like a a huge force within South Central and a community activist, but she does want to see Latasha's memory kept alive. And this was the first time Ty really opened up to a stranger about this story. So it's been really healing for her to just go back through these memories. And so often she'll just text me random memories that come to her. Uh, but she's a brilliant poet. And so they're just both working on their own individual lives right now, but still in conversation about how can they do something to remember Latasha. And oh, you asked one more question, and I really had something for it. I feel like I was it about the grief about what was or yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's something that really haunts me personally. Memories haunt me. Dreams are really impact me, and. I wanted them to feel like Latasha can be seen in any, any young girl. And so that's why the image is constantly changing of Latasha, wanting them to realize that we are all supporting them through this grief and that we understand the value of our bodies as black women and black girls and how, you know, that could have been me, that could have been any of my friends, it could have been them. So constantly wanting them to see what it looks like when the community of black girls come together to help rebuild this story. Thank you. Um, another uh, 
question that I had was thinking about um, black girl magic and um, how in some ways the term has lost its like meaning, right? Like now we say it and it's cute, but we're not really thinking about what it actually means. And I, what I feel um, in your storytelling style is like a real intuition and um, kind of like a use of, you know, witchcraft. I don't know like what you believe in, but I feel there's like a layer of spirituality there. And so could you talk about that a little bit? There's definitely spirituality, there's conjuring. Um, I deeply had to unlearn a lot that I've been trained in throughout school with filmmaking because it was just way too extractive. And so this film took two years to make because it was so spiritual, because it was constantly the conjuring of these memories of these dreams of times where I would go out with my creative producer and we would have an idea, but nothing really scripted and things would just fall into place as if Latasha's spirit was there with us. And I really believe that Latasha trusted me with this. It's something that I, I hold on to. I would have so many dreams of her, dreams that I'm watching old VHS tapes that don't exist, dreams that I'm meeting her mother. So I felt like for two years it was this interesting possession that was happening um, of Latasha like embedding herself within the project and giving that project permission. But spirituality, because our archives have been so erased and because they don't exist as fully as they can, we have to conjure these ancestral memories and have to figure out what the spiritual conversation is and the spiritual language through these visuals. Cool, thank you. Uh, questions? Yep. Is it work? Okay, sorry. Um, hi, I'm Sonny Wooden. Uh, I'm a second year MFA candidate here at Penn, and yeah, both those films are incredible. Like, I was I was about to cry sitting in my seat and everything, and just trying to make sure I get my question out. Um, so similar to a lot of the things that were happening, like I lost a bunch of friends when I was growing up in West Side Chicago, and like No Name was playing, so shout out No Name, thank you for that. Um, and my sister's now going through the same thing I went through of like losing friends in high school and like them not being there and really trying to reconcile what it what that means to her. So there's always like a post on someone's Instagram or Snapchat like, you know, rest in peace, like whomever. And my mom's like really trying to deal with that. She's like, who are these kids? And she doesn't understand like they're people that are in her community at school. And now I'm like uh, another like not necessarily a parent but someone that she goes to to talk to about these things. And I'm in a place where I'm starting to really believe in some of the stuff like um, uh, Jatavia was talking about with Arthur Jaffa, about what cinema can do and how it can help reconcile things. And really my question is, like, how do you practice in film and like, in filmmaking? Like, how do you, um, and some, like, I'm a photographer now, so I can, like, take an image and I can do it that way and progress. Uh, but within cinema, I feel like it's relatively difficult to have a sort of, um, not necessarily practice, but a, a rigor around how to do that consistently. So I just want to get better, honestly, and help my sister. <laughs> yeah. When I was in grad school, I used to have these little assignments where it was almost like creating visual poetry. This is what you're asking, just how to keep up a practice of filmmaking. Yeah, and I think that is also really hard because filmmaking is so, it's not the most accessible thing, which I, uh, I hate. Um, and I actually started off with photography as well because photography was so much more accessible and I only needed me to do it. And what's interesting is I always go, I've been working on a, a long-term self-portrait project and that's what I keep going back to. So every time I'm not doing film, I go back to that because it helps me get back to my core and my roots. Um, but I used to have these little like 30 second assignments of creating visual poetry and having like a story happen within that short amount of time. And it really helped me with my editing skills and it's something I would like to get back to because this project took a lot out of me and I found that I haven't enjoyed filmmaking for this past year. Like I don't enjoy picking up my camera um, just because it was so spiritual and it's hard to jump right back into something. So. I don't think there's anything wrong with continuing as photography to be your language that informs your filmmaking. Um, that is something that has kept me really grounded and filmmaking sometimes can be a little overwhelming for me just because of how many pieces there are to that puzzle. Um, but if 
that is a practice that you want to consistently keep up, I would say finding that community of people who will work together with you to create short films or just doing tiny little assignments for yourself. Sometimes I just, you know, go out and film things and then I edit it together and see how I can continually change it through the edit. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? juxtapose it was to the other film, um, which felt so much about place, but a kind of disparate uh, spaces of trauma. Um, I guess I was hoping you could speak to that and, and possibly how both of your films, maybe to the question before, um, in a kind of formal way, uh, have this like a uh, glitch, like this uh, tick um, as a kind of, uh, it's like a Benjaminian catastrophe or something, you know, it's like, a, constantly uh, reminding a self of uh, something, some collective trauma. Um, yeah, just if you could speak to space and place in the work of, of both of the, of the films. I'll mention the glitch very quickly because I loved that you put these two films together and I don't think either one of us realized we both had been using that effect. But for me, I wanted the film to constantly feel like the deterioration of memory and that you're moving through a dream. And I know for me personally, from my own trauma of loss, a lot of my memories are fuzzy. A lot of my memories don't make sense. There's bits and pieces that are missing. So this is what it looks like to rebuild something and not all of the pieces are there. So constantly wanting to remind people that this, this memory is falling apart, but we're sewing it back together. Um, and South Central was a, a critical, a crucial character. I looked at South Central as a character. Um, for me, I love, love, love South Central, and I feel like it's always perceived very negatively, not to take away from you know the, the truth of certain histories, but also there's so much beauty and magic, and there's just nuances that only those in the community will understand. So I, I always want this film to feel like a secret language of people in South Central and a secret language between black women and black girls. But I was constantly flying back and forth from grad school in North Carolina back to LA. So it was interesting to always have to come back home to do this project. Any others? Um, so I have two questions and they'll be the last. Um, one is, uh, what are you working on next and or, um, do you think you'll continue making more kind of experimental doc or are you moving into like a narrative work or a more conventional doc? Yeah. Uh, I love, love, love narrative and you can tell from the work that it's like a combination. All of my work is in conversation with fiction, fact and fiction. I grew up with a, a mom who's a storyteller, a folklorist, so constantly letting my worlds collide and so much of African folklore is still rooted within truth. So for me, my, my projects moving forward are tapping more into that and dealing more with dreams. Uh, I've been working on a long-term project, Dreaming Gave Us Wings, that reimagines the history of flying Africans. And it started as a self-portrait project um, two, three years ago, but now I'm looking at how to make it a more immersive experience or feature-length film. And I find myself moving further and further away from documentary, but still having the hybrid. I love documentary, I love storytelling, but I also have to accept that I'm an artist and looking for what that conversation will be. Um, and I, I really wanna focus on a story about the universe. I don't know what that's gonna look like, but uh, I've, been, I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was a young girl, so, so we'll see. Yeah. Did you have a quick question? Or that was just an acknowledgement? <laughs> Oh, Song of Solomon, yeah. Toni Morrison and the Flying Africans. Yeah. Yeah, real quick. So this film is not online. It's currently just doing festivals, but I'm hoping uh, sometime next year it will be more accessible. Yeah, thank you. But the Flying African short is online. The right? Flying African short is yeah. online. <laughs> it's through the New Yorker, but you can see the photo series on my website. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We Thank you. Another round of applause.